Good evening, welcome on behalf of uh, Kifi, uh, Paradox and Sirius and Studium Generale. We are co-organizing this event about uh, robots in hospital. Um, when people hear about robotic surgery, they usually think about a big machine who is operating on them autonomously without a doctor in the room, but that's not the case. Um, as far as I know, all robot surgery is performed by a medical doctor these days. But um, we will see what the future might bring. We have Sartak Misa, our first speaker of tonight, is a full professor at the UT in the field of surgical robotics. He is director of the surgical robotics lab. And in this lab, he develops technology which revolutionizes minimal invasive surgery. He builds magnetic micro-robots, which you can swallow and then you can manipulate them with magnetic fields so that you have a doctor inside your body doing things. That's a very exciting new technology. Can I have a big hand for Professor Sartak Misa? Do you mind dimming the lights a little bit? Uh, well, good evening, everybody, and uh, thank the organizers first for inviting me to give this uh, talk here, and also thank you for making the journey to come and listen to me. So um, what I will talk to you about today is about surgical robotics, but not just about surgical robotics at the micro scale, as, as Peter mentioned, but it'll be a journey across scale. So we'll walk you through some of the work that we do in the lab, starting with macro robots and then going down at the micro scale. Um, and I'll be give, give you a glimpse of what goes on in the lab. Um, but before I begin and talk to you about what I do in the lab and how I got there, I, I'd like to just give you a quick background of where I come from. So uh, my journey in the area of robotics started about 25 years ago, and I actually started working on large-scale space robots. And I, I worked at McGill University, and I worked on these large uh, multi-body structure satellites uh, uh, and how they behave uh, and their attitude dynamics. After that, I decided to actually work in industry, and I worked on the International Space Station program as a robotics analyst, because Canada builds and also controls all the robots that are on the space station. So I worked both in Montreal and, and in, in Houston. Um, following that, I actually decided to go back to school again, and that's where I got my PhD in the area of medical robotics. So I got my PhD at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, and I looked at the interactions of surgical tools with soft tissue for, for de developing these uh, surgical simulators. And about 15 years ago, I joined the University of Twente, uh, where I lead this surgical robotics lab. So the surgical robotics lab has locations both at the University of Twente, but also at the University Medical Center in Groningen. We have a fa fairly large lab uh, with, uh, uh, with a significant number of students and also a spin-off company from this lab. So if I were to describe in a few words, what do we do in this lab? So basically, we develop novel techniques to reach challenging locations within the body. So that's, that's the aim of this lab. And how do I think about doing this? So the first thing that we do is to develop these preoptive plans. So uh, if you came here from outside Enskede, Google Maps or Apple Maps would have told you go from point A to point B. So that's kind of what we do in this lab, where we figure out going from point A outside the body to point B inside the body, what's the way to do this? We de develop simulation models for this, uh, use various imaging modalities to, to develop these computational models. And once you develop these computational models, you need to control the instruments. And we control a variety of instruments, starting with flexible needles, large-scale robots, uh, continuum-style robots, and then going down several orders of magnitude, uh, we focus on these micro or nanorobotic structures. So in the next about uh, um, 20 minutes or so, I'd like to walk you through some of the things that we do in the lab. And so the first thing that I'll talk to you about is this idea of needle steering. So maybe the first question that you have in your mind is, why is this guy interested in needles so much? What's so special about needles? So needle insertion into soft tissue is one of the most common minimally invasive surgical procedure. So here have a few examples of needles being inserted into the body. So needles are used for, for example, in diagnosis, so in breast biopsies or in lung biopsies. They're also used in, in brain. So for, if you're severely depressed, there's deep brain stimulation, but also for, for sticking electrodes in the brain. 
They're also used for um, um, therapy, for example, in uh, prostate bracket therapy here, where you place radioactive seeds in very specific locations within the prostate, and this is used to uh, kill cancerous lesions. They're also used in liver ablation. So basically, a, 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 a clinician inserts a needle which has uh, radio frequency on it, and this basically kills or cooks regions of the liver. And this last example here, um, needles are also used for uh, for, for interventions in fetal surgery. So when the child is still in the womb, interventions can still be performed to, 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 to treat uh, congenital diseases. So in all of these cases, um, what you notice is that the needle must reach very specific locations within the organ. And what often happens is that the needle deviates from its intended path. And these deviations are due to organ deformation, anatomical obstructions, and just physiological processes such as breathing or respiration. So over the years, one of the ways to mitigate these needle targeting errors, we have devised this idea of needle steering. So how, how does this work? So the, this little cartoon or animation will highlight it. So a needle, a rigid needle, with a symmetric tip, such as this one, when you insert it into tissue, does not bend. But if you put a slight kink here, or a bevel here, or an edge here, um, due to this, due to the interactions of the needle tissue interaction forces, the needle kind of deflects when you insert it into tissue. So now, if you rotate this needle, the forces would act in the opposite direction, and the needle bends the other way. So in this way, you can insert, rotate, insert, and kind of snake your way into the body. So asking a clinician to do this is extremely challenging. Actually, I only know one clinician in the world who knows how to do this. He has a patent on this, and this is all he does. He only does these lung biopsies. He's a guy in, at, at New York, and if you have enough money to get treated by him, this is what he would do with his hand. But most clinicians find, are not able to do this. So over the years, we have developed this idea to robotically steer needles in this manner. So this uh, kind of video shows you what's going on. So it, here is a needle, a bevel tip needle. There are camera images tracking it from the top. The needle is being told, avoid these obstacles and reach this target. So right around here, I will rotate the needle, and the needle will bend the other way. So this is, this is not simulation. This is actually doing experiments in the lab. And this is happening also autonomously. So there's cameras tracking it and it, the robot is kind of telling it when to rotate. And it reaches its target. So this is a planar 2D simple case. But over the years, we have taken this idea and developed several kinds of needle steering devices. So the first one on the top here has path planning going on. So you have a million different paths being computed, and it tells you when to rotate the needle, when there are uncertainties in the environment, when there are obstacles coming in, because life is full of uncertainties, and there are uncertainties also inside our body. And you can't model all these things. So that's why you have these path planners also going in. The human body is not flat. There are bumps on it, and there's, there's curves on it. So how do you account for these bumps and curves as you move your needle? Um, the, Patients are also have respiration, there's movement. So when you have these kinds of disturbances, how do you account for needle steering happening? And the last one here was needle steering with teleoperation. So in this case, the student was in his lab in Italy, in Siena, and the robot was here in, in, in Twente. And we were demonstrating that you could actually do needle steering in a remote manner. So all this ugly Frankenstein-looking equipment over the years was transformed into something that looks like this. So all this stuff was put in a, in a cylinder. And these are experiments done at Kroningen so in a CT scanner with a phantom, but also with uh, uh, human cadavers. So this, the project here that was was for, for doing lung biopsies. So in general, lung biopsies are extremely challenging to do. And Surgeons don't like to do it because the, all the other complications that happen. And if you actually look at a lung biopsy tool, it looks like basically like a screwdriver. And, uh, and, it's extreme, and it's just very challenging to do this. So we were trying to demonstrate that you can do robotic needle steering for lung biopsies. Another example of a needle steering device is this, uh, 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 this robot that we developed. This is an MR-compatible robot. So this was developed for interventions in the prostate, to, to take prostate biopsies. So for those of you who might know that uh, anything that you put in the MR has to be, cannot be metallic in there. So you need, so this device runs on pneumatics and piezoelectric uh, and structures. And this device is actually now commercialized and we're doing preclinical trials with this, uh, uh, both at Nijmegen but also in, in Groningen. So this, this kind of journey of needle steering with flexible devices, I'd like to continue with this idea and, and take it one step further. So I'd like to now focus on something called continuum robots. 
So uh, P Peter kind of uh, in introduced the topic briefly in his, when, he was, when he was started this, this, uh, this symposium. But when most people think of robots, they think of something like this. You know, robots that are industrial can do extensive pick and place tasks, can do this in a repetitive manner. But when I think of robots, I think of something like this. So this is a, a, a robot that is developed by Festo. It's a pneumatically controlled device, something that looks like an elephant trunk and has unlimited degrees of freedom. Or robots that look like this, that are autonomous and move uh, in, in, in a, like a snake-like environment. So this class of robots are known as continuum robots. Con continuum robots are robots with unlimited degrees of freedom and have great steerability and dexterity. So where are robots like these used for, for medical applications? Potentially, they are used in, in cases like here, where you want to have extremely challenging locations within the body, so narrow places to get into for cardiac surgery, or in the brain area going through the nose. That's, one er that's, that's where you would need a flexible or steerable device. And in general, in endoscopic surgery, so complex endoscopic instruments not just, don't just have a camera on it, but also have all these tools um, to, to perform surgery, and you need several clinicians to operate it. So one of the key things in all these continuum robots that we focus on in the lab is how to localize them, how to find where this instrument is inside the body. And there are several ways to do this. So uh, one way is using MR images. Uh, but the, the challenge with MR imaging is that images don't come in real time, and the kinds of materials that you can use in, in an MR scanner is also something that is a constraint. So you can't use any metallic uh, elements in, in an MR scanner. Computed tomography or x-rays, that's another example. Uh, but again, that, that exposes the, both the patient and also the clinician to ionizing radiation. Electromagnetic tracking is another example, but then again, there's, it gets affected by metal, and there's a lot of metal in the operating room. And the last one here is ultrasound. Ultrasound is great. It's, it's, uh, it has, it's, it's cheap. Most places have an ultra, ultrasound machine, but you can see the images, images are really crappy, right? So there's poor uh, uh, spatial resolution. So what we have done over the past years is developed these sensors called, based called fiber brag grating sensors. What they are are basically optical fibers with specialized cuts on them. And they're about 250 micron. Um, and you can actually stick them on a needle here. So that's what's happening here. And based on light, passing light of a certain wavelength through them, you can estimate the deflection. So this is in real time. You are estimating, rendering the deflection of, of a needle. So you can see that the implications of this, that you can insert a fiber like this onto your endoscope or any flexible device and, 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 and estimate the deflection. So what this next kind of set of video shows that basically that you have, we took this fiber brag rating sensor, integrated into our instruments, and then tried to use this to navigate the device. So in the, these two sets of videos, um, there's this continuum robot with these tendons or these uh, pulleys on them, and it's kind of steering around this obstacle and reaching the target. These sensors can also be used to estimate force. So one of the key things in minimally invasive surgery is that once you uh, interact with tissue, you don't want to damage healthy tissue, but these sensors can also estimate force. And you can also fuse information. So take sensor data from your FBG sensors or these fibers and also fuse it with ultrasound and that get a better estimate of your, of your environment. And in the last video here, basically what I was showing is that there's a flexible needle with a f not, not, a, not a fixed uh, tip, but a steerable tip. So now you have kind of a, a needle where the bending of this tip can be controlled as you're moving inside the body. And then we put in FBG sensors in there. So this is one example of sensorization of your instrument. Another example of sensorization is this study here. So this was a study with, that we did with TU Delft and also a company that was based in, based in Amsterdam who built this, who we, who we worked and built this device with. So this has kind of 24 cables running in there. The application for this was in uh, valve repair. So that's valve repair in the heart is extremely challenging. Generally, it's a traumatic procedure, requires open heart surgery. Uh, but what we were trying to develop is this instrument where you could repair a uh, valve in a minimally invasive manner going in through, um, through the juggler area here. And what we did in this instrument is also put electromagnetic sensors and also fuse this with ultrasound. Again, the idea here is to show you an example of how these minimally invasive instruments of the future might look like. 
So in all of these cases, you have these tendons running through them. As soon as you put tendons or cables running through them, it makes you cannot miniaturize instruments uh, anymore. You have certain limitations. Also, there's mechanical problems with it in terms of friction um, that you want to avoid. So what, what we have thought is why not wirelessly kind of uh, actuate these instruments? Instead of tendons, can we apply external energy? And this external energy could be in the form of magnetic fields. And so the idea is that you would have a flexible instrument that would be kind of steered around obstacles, and you would apply magnetic fields to it that could be, make it deflect, and you would reach your target here. And that's what we did next, is basically have these flexible instruments. This is a uh, standard catheter, but we put uh, a, a magnet on the top of it, and what you see moving around here is electromagnetic coils. So now you have an instrument which is magnetic, doesn't have tendons running through them, and you can miniaturize it as much as you want. And you, these magnetic fields are not harmful to the patient. You can also, also demonstrate that these catheters can be used for kind of simple grasping operations. So they do, cannot, they can use just not only be used for guide wires, but also be used for some functionality. How are we doing? Some more examples of using magnetics in the operating room. So this is an example of a, of a system where um, an electromagnetic coil is attached to the end of a robot arm, and this robot arm kind of moves all across the patient. So then you have complete coverage of the patient's body. And the applications for this, this was a, 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 from, a, from a clinician a request for developing a kind of drill that we use for, for clearing blockages in the arteries. And we demonstrated that with this drill that was magnetically controlled, you could uh, reduce uh, uh, the, 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 or improve the percentage of uh, accuracy by about 33%. Then we went one step further with this. So why do we have coils on the outside of the patient's body? Why can't we have these coils inside the patient's body? And that's why we developed this kind of a catheter system that has three electromagnetic coils that are miniaturized, and it inserts into the body, patient's body, and opens up like a flower. And then you can control the, your micro-robot that is here in, inside. You can also project this capsule, but also retrieve it back. Because one of the key things in all of this is that you deliver a robot, but you also want to get it back out. And that's what, uh, um, th that's what this project was about. So the idea here was to show that coils cannot just be used external to the body, but also internal to the body. Some more examples of how, these, how magnetics can be used uh, in, in various applications. So this is an example not just of hard magnet, but a soft magnet. So this is a set of polymers with magnetic material in them. And it, the idea here was to show that you can go through these torturous paths um, way more accurately than what, than what a normal clinician would actually do, so uh, when, when, do, when guiding a guide wire through the process. You can also combine magnetic material with shape memory polymers. So what's special about shape memory polymers? Shape memory polymers are basically material. When you heat them up, they get into a certain shape, uh, so you can change their flexibility. And then when you cool them down, they go back to their original shape. And these, the temperature at which these operate are, are biocompatible. So they operate at around 37 to 30, 42 degrees Celsius. So the idea here was to show that you can have instruments that are not just uh, 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 rigid, but also flexible, and also you can change their flexibility. So you can steer them around obstacles. So the idea here was to use them for intervention, for polyps removal in, 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 the, in, the, um, in the gastrointestinal tract. So coming now to the last part of my, my, my lecture, um, well, is, is going down even one order of magnitude into this area of micro-robotics. Um, so th so micro-robotics in general can be, the idea is that you'd kind of steer this flexible device, go around obstacles, reach somewhere in the body, but once you reach down where you want to go, you must want to do something. And that's where we, we focus on these micro-robotic systems. So there are kind of two classes of micro-robotic systems. Um, one are micro-robots that are magnetically steered and magnetically actuated, meaning that, like a compass, you point them at a certain direction, and then you apply magnetic fields to move them around, or you, they are magnetically steered, so you point them at a certain direction, but then they generate energy by themselves and then can move, uh, uh, move around. So examples of the last one are these microjets, which I'll briefly get into, 
or magnetotactic bacteria. So bacteria are available in nature. They, um, this, these bacteria you can find a, along the coast of Zeeland here in the Netherlands, but also you can cultivate them in the lab. And you can cultivate in the lab and also uh, add how much magnetic material you want in them. Um, so you can, you can basically make, make these hybrid structures which are alive. Um, um, and, so, and then you can control them around. So here's a video showing them moving around in a, in a, in, on, a, on a square path. While the uh, robots that follow in this category, um, for example, uh, I'll talk about some of these here, but this is kind of a hybrid robot. So it's basically a tube that we fabricate in the clean room here, but it has a bovine sperm cell in there, and the sperm cell is alive. So the sperm cell enters into this tube, the, the tail f f f kind of uh, sways, and moves this robot around. So this is an example of a hybrid robot that you can also fabricate. While well, rest of these robots are kind of made in the clean room or in our lab, so I'll, I'll get into some of them. So in order to move these robots, um, you need to somehow uh, actuate them. And over the years, we have developed several different actuation systems. So if you come to our lab, you'll see many of these structures. So depending on the application that you have in mind, so uh, if you want to do things in planar, this is one example. If you want to move things in 3D, these are a couple of examples, the Mars 2 or the BatMag uh, setup. Uh, the Big Mac setup is something that is uh, for you moving catheters around. And the reason why it's called Big Mac is that the student who developed it, he thought, and it does indeed look like a Big Mac. So that's the reason why he calls it Big Mac. Um, so, and some systems like Moby Mag, which is a portable system you can carry in, in, a, in a suitcase for our, to work with our collaborators. And this system I'll get into slightly later on and towards the end of my talk, uh, where, which we spun off, and there's a spin-off company on this, which is basically a, uh, a coil that is attached to the end of a robot arm. So the first kind of micro-robot I'd like to get into is this, are these uh, um, cluster of nanoparticles. So their nanoparticles are basically used as contrast agents. Radiologists often use them to, uh, to detect cancer within the body. Uh, what we wanted to demonstrate here is that you can control these nanoparticles or microparticles with microscopic images and move them along very specific paths. What we also demonstrated that you can uh, visualize these micro-sized objects with ultrasound. So we develop image processing techniques whereby you can visualize micro-sized objects with ultrasound as your imaging modality. What we also demonstrated here, you can do uh, independent control. So meaning that you have two objects, you can track both of them at the same time, and then move them around. You cannot just track two objects, but multiple objects. So the idea was to show that you can do this formation control. So in this case, the person writes, or the robot writes UT. And all of this is happening autonomously. There's no human intervention here. The next example that I'd like to talk to you about are these grippers. So there's, they're, very, they're very special grippers. Um, so when I started this talk, I had a animation about a needle, right? So needles can be used for biopsies. But what if you could uh, make procedure even less invasive and use these grippers? So what's special about these grippers? These grippers are made of hydrogels, and they have magnetic material in them. But when you heat them up, they close. And when you cool them up, they open. And you can repeatedly do this. And so in this first set of video, what we are showing here is that take the pink ball, put it in the pink circle, the blue ball in the blue circle, and the green ball in the green circle and do this repeatedly and autonomously. So it has to plan itself where, these, where the start location is and where the target location is. In this set of example here, there are these blobs or these obstacles randomly moving around, and we tell this gripper, try to avoid these, these, uh, these blue and, uh, and, and blobs and reach the target location here, and then close yourself up and then move back up again. Again, this is happening autonomously. And I think the, and the last one here, the student who was doing this probably had a lot of time on hands, and he decided, let me play Pac-Man with them. And so what is happening here is that this, this gripper is, is rapidly replanning itself. There are these ghosts moving around, and he has to avoid being eaten up by these ghosts and reach the target point. And this is, again, he's not, there's no human intervention in all of this. But the basic idea in all of this was to show that when there are uncertainties, things are dynamic, things are changing, your robot can also account for it and, 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 and replan and reach its target location. 
And the last example here was to show that you can also not just use camera or microscopic images to track, but also use ultrasound images. And incidentally, this study was done in porcine tissue, so in pig tissues when the, this, these set of experiments were done. The next uh, two micro robots I'd like to talk to you about is this microjet. So microjet is in the Guinness Book of World Records as the world's smallest jet engine. So it's 50 microns. It is made of platinum and gold. And when you put it in hydrogen uh, peroxide, it ejects bubbles. And so like a jet, it moves around. So the goal here was to show that you can track uh, these, these are self-propelled devices that you can track this micro robot and accurately move it to a certain location, keep it in that location, and then move to another point. The reason why this study was developed was basically to have these jet, these small tubes for eye surgeries, the application area. Because in some contact lens fluids, the concentration of there is a small, very small concentration of hydrogen peroxide, and you can use this to propel um, uh, in it in, in non-viscous mediums. This example, this one got a lot of media attention a few years ago. Uh, it was uh, all over the news. It's called magnetosperm. This is developed in our clean room here in Twente. It's inspired from bacteria and from human sperm cells. It's about six times larger than a, than a human sperm cell. It has a magnetic head and a, and a long, thin, flexible tail. Um, the idea here was that you would coat your head of this uh, magnetosperm with uh, drugs, and you could uh, have accurate drug delivery in various applications. So the way this works is that you apply oscillating magnetic fields, the tail starts to flap, and you can guide it to a certain direction. Um, so the reason I feel that my, my feel, because we have a lot of different fabrication techniques, and the fabrication technique here that was used was um, 3D printing at the micro scale, but I feel that this got a lot of media attention is I think because the word sperm was in there. And that, that, that's the reason why they, they kind of uh, uh, harped on it like uh, there's a, uh, but that, that's my take on this. Um, so to kind of close off of, uh, of my talk since I'm almost coming to the end, so I, I showed you several of, uh, quickly, I very quickly went through some of the things that we do in the lab and, and the innovations going on uh, in our lab. But in spite of all these, these innovations, um, in reality, this is what surgery looks like right now. This is one of my clinical collaborators at MST. Um, he, he's, a, he's a thoracic surgeon. Uh, this is what he does for a living. So surgery is extremely traumatic. Uh, it is, uh, it, it, this is an open heart surgery. And it takes a long time for patients to heal. Most patients can't most elderly patients um, are not able to, to, to go through a procedure like this. So what, what do I see as the vision or the future of, of, of uh, surgical robotics? So there are kind of three things that I'd like to share with you. One is on bio-inspired uh, bio robots. That's what I think, in, in my view, miniaturization and bio-inspired robots are, are things that uh, we should look for in the future. Um, so these are things that we have developed in the lab. This is a turtle-inspired uh, robot. So it has magnetic legs and a, and a flexible body. You apply magnetic fields, and it can, it can move across various surfaces. It can move on, on, on vertical surfaces. You can move in, in various complex environments. This is an origami-inspired robot. So what happens here is that you heat it up. It opens up like a starfish. It can deliver drugs. It can close again. It can... It, and it can go through various environments, and it has magnetic material in them. This last example, uh, something we also developed in the clean room, so I talked a lot about magnetics, right? But you don't need only magnetics. You can also use sound waves or acoustics to guide, guide robots. So this is a, a squid-inspired robot, so I think when we developed this, Squid Games was on, uh, on Netflix, and the guy got inspired by using cephalopods. So cephalopods are basically organs that uh, take in water, uh, have a process, and then eject out uh, 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 so that they can then propel themselves forward. So what we have here are tiny cavities that have bubbles in there, and we vibrate sound waves at very specific frequencies. These bubbles vibrate, and then you can get this kind of motion. So this person here we wrote SRL, or Surgical Robotics Lab. And you can get also uh, nice starry night-like images here on the top where uh, by using acoustic waves, fire them at certain frequency, move things in one frequency versus the other. The next area that I think is the, is, is the future of surgical robotics is in the area of uh, imaging. So I had uh, shown you ultrasound as an imaging modality, but what I foresee happening is robotic ultrasound. 
So a robot's controlling an ultrasound probe in an autonomous manner, uh, going over the patient in, in, a, in a harmless manner, and also tracking objects, uh, not just larger objects, but also micro-sized objects, is, is what I see as the future of, uh, of, of, uh, of in, in the area, of, at least in the area of imaging. Another area of imaging that we're really excited about is this uh, two, a multicolor fluorescence or two-photon microscopy. So if you really want to look at objects at the sub-micron level inside the body, um, you need to go down and, and uh, to, to, to basically dye your, your robots with certain, certain dyes and then fire light at a certain wavelength and then observe them. So what we are really focusing on the lab is trying to miniaturize these custom-made devices that you can miniaturize, put them on a probe, and then insert them into the body to actually track micro-sized objects. And finally, the last uh, thing that I, I'd like to get into is in the area of actuation. So I have a short video to show this. So I talked a lot about magnetic actuation. There are not many magnetically actuated devices in the OR, but I think this is something that I really uh, I think is the future also of in the area of surgical robotics. And this is really a spin-off from our lab, but, and, I'll, and I'll, there's some audio with it where a clinician actually um, tried using it. Dit systeem, de, de Flux Robotics, heeft de potentie om dat helemaal niet met de lichting te hoeven doen, eh, maar van tevoren te bedenken en op basis van je CT-fusie te zeggen tegen de machine volg de Central Luma Line en zorg dat ik van A naar B kom. Met nul doorlichting op dat moment. En de magneet, toen ik hem eh, aanstuurde die richting op, kwam zonder enige hulp van een, van, van een katheter, ging gewoon een bochtje om en kwam in dat vat terecht. Ja, dat zou je met een gewone voerraad nooit gelukt zijn. So, so before I kind of close and, and end my talk, um, I'd like to share with you this uh, 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 short video. Uh, um, so this is something that inspired me a lot in my work. Um, and this was a movie from the 1960s. Uh, and the story here is that uh, the US president had a blood clot. And, uh, and the Russians had injected the blood clot. It's always the Russians. Uh, and this was the 60s. Um, and and uh, so the CIA decided they need to send doctors in the body uh, to try to uh, prevent the clot from reaching the brain. Um, so I'd like to share the small snippet of this and maybe as uh, Peter uh, indicated that the future is basically trying to swallow your surgeon or swallow your doctor. You are listening to the sound of a completely new screen experience a startling new kind of excitement. As 20th Century Fox plunges you into the most incredible adventure that man could ever achieve. But now, a film called Fantastic Voyage has broken through in an unexpected direction to create an adventure of astonishing suspense and beauty. One of the miracles of the universe. Off on a fantastic voyage, actually entering inside the human body, exploring an unknown universe, unknown dangers. They're tightening. I can't breathe. So those, I, I think those, those things look like my, my hydrogel grippers. But uh, uh, with that, uh, I'd like to thank you once again for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak here, and thank you all for coming. Thank you. So, thank you for your fantastic voyage through the world of surgical robotics. It was really, really fascinating. Thank you. Uh, when can this be applied in the hospital on real patients? Because so we're in the process of doing actually preclinic animal trials right now. So in, in a month, uh -huh. uh, next month actually mm -hmm. in Utrecht, we, because that's the only place in the Netherlands you can do large animal studies. Yes. So okay. we are doing that uh, next month on live animals. Uh -huh. So I hope uh, within the next uh, two years uh, you should see one uh, in a hospital in close a real to the magneto sperm. Yeah. When do you think that? I, I that we, that uh, I hope in my my maybe not in my lifetime, but maybe yes. my child's lifetime. But maybe simpler versions of micro robots, capsule style robots, is what are are I think uh, more closer in the near future. I was just wondering, uh, with regards to uh, diagnostic skills for micro robotics, do you believe that it would be possible to add? Um, 
for example, um, sensors that can uh, identify neural networks wherein you say this is bad tissue, this is not bad tissue, so that the micro uh, bot can actually do the diagnostic itself instead of just did, yeah, relying on uh, the surgeon in that regard. Well, that, that's a very nice question. So actually, <laughs> I didn't have time for this, but we have a few students in the lab using these micro robots and having, have actually put pH sensors on them. So you can dis di diagnose whether it's acidic or basic, and depending on what uh, where you are in the body, uh, the, the organ there is either acidic or basic. So pH sensors is one. We've also developed a miniaturized temperature sensors. So you can, and then wirelessly kind of heat up the sensor that's inside the body. So you can do localized ablation. So you can do first diagnosis and then do actually also do the therapy without much invasiveness. So those are two examples of what we are exploring, but there's other, various other things that, that can be done uh, and we work a lot with people from the, from the pharmaceutical department, but also people in, in the in chemistry department who have much more knowledge in, in the kinds of materials out there. But these are two examples that we are currently working on. Mm -hmm. And are there also pills you can swallow which can scan your uh, stomach and your uh, derma, what's it called? Uh, uh, Intestine. Sorry? Intestine. Yes, exactly, yeah. yeah. Is it possible already? Yeah, or, or? so there, there is a, uh, something called pill cam that's in the market yes. right now that yeah. has a camera on it. Uh, beyond that, it doesn't do much, so you can't, you can't really control it. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, if you could have a, put a magnet on it and then mm -hmm. control it from the outside, then you could at least stop, take pictures. Not, right now, it kind of just goes as it flows. So yes. that's, yeah, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. the, but yeah, that's the idea. Incredible. Yeah, there you are. Well, uh, first, of all, uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation. It was really interesting. Um, from what I saw from the activation of the micro-robots, you now mainly rely on the magnetic coils. Uh, what would be the move to use this in a clinical application? Because you can't really big coils in a surgical room, right? Yes, yeah, so, so it's a nice question. So the, um, the <laughs> robot that I showed you that the clinician was operating on, it, it's, it's, um, so it's a robotic arm. There, there are robots in, 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 the, in, in the clinic. So we have the Da Vinci robot, for example, in our lab uh, uh, where, we, where we have also actually put coils on them. But the, so they're those, and those are gigantic robots. But so, so in the operating room, clinicians are used to seeing robots, so it's not a new thing for them. And this robot, the one with the magnetic coil, is a standard KUKA robot that is, that is uh, medically certified. So, so it's something that can be used in the OR. The coil is fairly small, about 7 to eight, 10 kgs. Um, and it, and it, since it's a, on a robot arm, you can actually move it around. So it's, it's not in the way of the clinician or the other uh, OR staff that's in the room. Um, so I, I think... Uh, um, it's, it's not an obtrusive uh, uh, device and has a um, relatively small floor space. Um, so I think that, that's the reason why I think there's acceptance for using these kinds of robotic systems in the operating room. Uh, just a follow-up question. Yeah. Uh, because I think the robot arm has one coil, right? Uh, well, this one has one. We have robot arms that look also like an electric razor, like the Philly shave three of them. So you have also robot arms that look like that. We have robot, ar we have robot arms that have coils that look like a C arm, so coils on the top, coils on the bottom, so they can go all the way. So configurations are several. Um, you can have one, you can have three, you can... It's, it's basically how, what weight restrictions you have, how much power you need, uh, uh, what field, what field gradients you need, so depending on the application in mind. Okay. Well, thank you. Welcome. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Sartak. We have to round off because Herman Rulink is waiting to give his lecture. So I want a big hand for your fantastic voice. Thank, thank you, you very much. <laughs> okay, now we turn to Herman Rulink. Uh, Herman is a medical doctor, a urologist at the CGT Hospital in Almelo. Um, Dr. Rulink operates with help of the Da Vinci XI robot. That's a very big machine. You will see it in a couple of moments with arms and moving like that. Um, besides that, Hermann Ruhink um, also joined Expedition Robinson. Um, so the, the surface is very good. Yeah. And how is it um, protected against um, that, that some kind of a, one of the motors is, is getting heated or, or making weird moves? That, that well, should be all 
the robot is when when you compare it to the last presentation, our robot is very childish. Mm -hmm. It's it's really a master slave machine. It, yes. I wish there was a button on it that says "Take out the prostate, you can go drink coffee." <laughs> it's <laughs> not the way it is. Um, we use the robot in our hospital just for prostatectomies as urologist at the moment. Yes, yeah, yeah. And um, we are planning. We are getting a second robot in our hospital. We are planning to do also the cystectomies. That's a more difficult operation. Well, what, what happens with a cystectomy? With a cystectomy, you take mm -hmm. out the urine bladder and with, a, with in a man also the prostate, and then you. Uh, mm -hmm. You 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 um, create a new bladder from gut and you um, can really put it back in okay. with a ureters on it and then a patient can pee itself or you make a stoma yes artificial um, and uh, exit for urine mm -hmm. with a, a little, little pack on the abdomen we do the operation now with a, a big incision in the abdomen it's it's quite bloody uh, and if you do it laparoscopically it's better but it's very difficult operation when you do it laparoscopically mm -hmm. and every laparoscopic operation that's difficult can be done better with a robot mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i will show that in the in, in the presentation if we yep. get it um my name is herman ruling uh i'm a urologist in the, almost always in almelo and Engelo, but also we work in enschede so we call ourselves the urology center twente um we are one uh, group of urologists here in twente and um we make a division in what pathology is done uh, in Enschede and what pathology we do in, in Almelo. Um, and in our UCT, in a, f in a few weeks, we have three robot systems to use for difficult laparoscopic operations. Um, my disclosures, <laughs> I have none. Um, when you talk about uh, surgery, um, in urology, it's of often it's um, uh, open surgery in the abdomen. Uh, we go for the bladder, we go for the prostate. And, and it used to be very large operations. Um, and large operations, it, it sounds horrible, but that's, it has many advantages that, that you can see here. We have very long experience with doing open surgery. And um, we have haptic feedback. So when we touch something, we really feel if there's a tumor, if it's stony, we, we can feel with our fingers. And that's in open uh, operations, it's very uh, important. We have a broad 3D, 3D vision, at least when you have two working eyes, you can see 3D, you see everything, and that's an, an advantage. Um, the shorter learning curve, you can operate with someone who can't operate, and if he's doing something wrong, you just push him away and you can take over. That's very safe. Um, if someone is operating laparoscopically, it's more difficult to take over or to, to, to prevent something uh, from going wrong. It's also a very cheap operation. You don't need an expensive robot. You don't need any expensive material to blow up an abdomen or have uh, special instruments. And often, at least in the beginning, it's faster than doing a laparoscopic operation. But there are also disadvantages, and they're quite large. Um, that's the reason that many surgeons are turning to laparoscopy because of the advantages. Um, the disadvantages are a significant more blood loss, and that's obvious because when you open an abdomen and you make something bleed, then there is room pressure and the blood comes out. So um, you, you lose, when something is bleeding, you lose a lot of blood in a short time. Um, it's the large trauma that you are producing to your patient, um, so the post-operative recovery is taking longer. Um, there's also a lot of indirect cost when you operate and it's cheap, but someone has to go to the IC unit or uh, can't work for a longer period, then everything makes uh, uh, it more costly. So it's, sometimes it's more costly to do an open operation than to do an expensive one laparoscopically. Um, and less intraoperative uh, interoper novelties. We just saw the professor show beautiful uh, things for the future and there are almost no interesting things in open surgery. It's always less invasive, uh, more robotic. So the way to go is to be more patient friendly and that's not to improve the open surgery. Open surgery is learning from laparoscopically, uh, from laparoscopic surgery. If someone sees really well how the anatomy looks during a laparoscopic operation, the open operations become better. That's something we saw in our uh, hospital with the cystectomies. Um, and there is poor er uh, ergonomics when you do an open operation and you have to be somewhere down in the abdomen. You have to stand uh, a bit nasty. You have to stand on your feet. It's, it's more difficult to do something standing than when you are sitting. So the ergonomics are not perfect. So we invented laparoscopy and we are doing it quite a while. Um, and this is the way it looks. No big incisions. When you put all the small incisions and uh, next to each other, of course, there's a large incision, but the, the trauma inside of the patient is very small. 
Um, the advantages of laparoscopic uh, operating is uh, there is vision on the spot. You have the camera right on the place where you want to look. And when you are operating on a prostate, you have to be below the um, symphysis, uh, pubic uh, bone. And it's difficult to look in an open operation, but when you put your camera right under the pubic bone, you can see it perfectly. So the vision is better. The morbidity is less, the blood loss is less because of the pressure in the uh, operating field. You put CO2 gas in the abdomen and it stops the blood vessels from bleeding, so less blood loss. Um, the, the trauma is less, so there are less adhesions after the surgery. When you go in again after a few years, that's better to operate because there's less trauma in the abdomen. Uh, that's because of the inflammation reaction that's less, uh, the f recovery is faster. Um, well, some people um, say cosmetics is better, but when you put all the incisions next to each other, the cosmetics isn't that much better. Or you have to do a single port surgery when you are making one incision and you put all the instruments through one incision and you can say it's better cosmetics. But the ergonomics are even worse. When you are doing laparoscopy operation, you have to stand next to your patient. You have to tilt yourself. Uh, you, have to become, uh, you have to operate from all the sides to get uh, at the place where you want to be. So the ergonomics in laparoscopy are far worse than in open surgery. The difficult learning curve is very steep. Um, there's something very pe 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 peculiar when you are doing a laparoscopic operation. When you are moving your hands outside of the patients to the right, the instrument on the inside goes to the left. So that's called um, um, uh, uh, crossing of your instruments. When you're going up in the patient, the instrument goes down. And also the scaling means when I um, have the instrument far in the patient and I put a little bit pressure to the right, then my instrument goes a lot to the left. So it's very difficult to learn to do a laparoscopic operation. If one has the chance to um, practice on a, on a practice um, 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 model, where you have to put something in a, in a little, when you have to pick up a pea and put it in a little basket, you really should try it laparoscopically. And then afterwards you have to try it with a robot. Then you can see what there is, that there is a fantastic advantage in operating with a robot because it's very difficult to learn to do something laparoscopically. Um, and the costs are higher and the time, it takes more time to operate in the beginning. Um, and then there is the robot. Um, we started using our robot quite um, late. We started in, two th in, in late 2014, really um, got with it in uh, 2015. Um, and um, well, it's, it's a fantastic machine to operate the difficult cases laparoscopically. Um, it's a master-slave configuration, I already said that. It does nothing out of itself. It's very um, nice to work with if you have to cough or you want to drink a cup of coffee or take some nuts. You just take your head out of the console and everything stands still. So it's very safe um, to, to take a break and to relax. Um, the ergonomics are uh, much better than in open surgery and also much better than in laparoscopic surgery. Because of that, you can do a lot of more operations without neck pain or wrist pain. And it's something that's really a problem with a lot of surgeons and urologists. Um, the 3-day three three day visions comes back when you are using our system and every uh, hospital that's using uh, robotic surgery in Holland, almost 99% uses the Da Vinci machine. Every machine has a 3D um, camera system, so you are really like you are snorkeling in the, in the Red Sea. Everything is very clear. You can look around in the abdomen of your patient. It's fantastic. And always you have the best cameraman because you are your own cameraman. So you can't uh, swear on the nurse that's holding your camera. You are doing it yourself. Because if you don't look right, then it's your own fault. But you are your own cameraman with one arm. Um, so you are the surgeon with a camera, but also two hands to operate with. And there is a, another hand that you can use as an assistant arm. So with four arms, you operate at one time. And that makes it much more easy to do the operation yourself. And there is also someone helping you. So we do our operations almost always with six ports, where uh, two are for my assistant. And my assistant helps me by uh, using a sucker to, to, to um, uh, get some blood or urine out of the abdomen. And also, uh, my assistant gives me uh, some stitches so I can repair something. So we do the operation uh, with six uh, incisions. And four of the instruments are um, used by myself. And there is reverse scaling. I mean, when 
I can, um, I can adjust the machine. I can tell my machine if I move one centimeter in the outside and the inside is just half a centimeter. So I can make it very delicate or I can make it a bit more gross. Um, it's something I can um, tell my machine how to, uh, to, to amplify my motions or, or just not to amplify, to simplify them. Um, and it really, um, like it says there, it uh, simplifies difficult and physically heavy laparoscopic operations and it enables laparoscopy, laparoscopy with most of the disadvantages of laparoscopy. So when we are doing open cystectomies right now, that is just because of our um, 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 capacity of the robot. We only can do prostates because then our machine is full for urology. The surgeon and the gynecologist want to use the machine also. But the second robot makes that we can use the machine also for the difficult uh, cystectomy. We can't do it laparoscopically. It's too difficult. But with the robot, we can. We already did, but our capacity is just uh, too small to... Uh, to uh, go on with that. But it's quite an investment. Our first robot system costed us 2 million euros. Not only the robot, but also the um, um, advancement, uh, the, the things we had to uh, rebuild in our OR. So it was quite expensive. Um, it's getting a little bit less expensive. The, the, there is competition, so that makes the price a little bit better. And um, Well, there are things that makes it a bit more uh, easy to, to, to start with, but it is quite expensive. This is my colleague, uh, one of my beautiful colleagues. I have two uh, female colleagues who are doing the prostate operations also, and they are very happy with the machine. Um, one of my colleagues started just a, just one year ago and makes exactly the same results as we do. So it's very learnable. If you are learning laparoscopy, it takes much more time to get the, 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 the same results uh, in continence, in... Uh, in, 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 in um, um, uh, if, if you take the, 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 the prostate nicely, if the, the, um, the margins are free, if, if you take out a tumor, the pathologist says if you've done it well or not, and the margins should be free, then there's no cancer on the outside of the prostate. So if all these things are uh, all right, when my colleague just started one year ago and is doing just the same as we do, then that says something about her, but also about the machine that she is using to do this uh, operation. Here you see the machine. It consists of three different th uh, things. We have the, the console. Here I'm sitting, put my head on the rest over there. This machine is uh, the commu communication between me behind the console and the arms of the robot. These arms um, will be connected to the patient and you slide in the instruments that you can use multiple times um, and, um, and then you do the operation. This is... Uh, it's like diving, you put your head on in there and it's looking into an aquarium and the aquarium is your patient and you really see fantastic how it looks on the inside. Um, this is uh, real life. Um, our robot is uh, standing here. These are the arms in the patient. The assistant is here standing on the right of the patient. Nowadays, the, pa the, the assistant is on the other side. It's more easy because all our assistants are right-handed and then on the left side of the, pa the patient, it's easier to work. Um, the head of the patient is over there <coughs> and the legs are here. So the, the position of the table is 30 degrees down. So all the um, gut is sliding away in the, in the direction of the head so there's more space to operate in the lower abdomen. Um, I've got, I, I believe the presentation will be available uh, after this. Uh, so um, these are links. You can uh, watch if you want to know more about how the operation robot works. Uh, we have um, uh, recorded one operation, and it's this link. Um, the compilation, this, the, this link, if you, if you click that, then you see one half an hour of the operation with explanation. So if you see the presentation, you can use the link and it's just on our website. Um, I want to show you something that we um, 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 really um, experienced as an enormous benefit of robot surgery for our patients. Our continence rate went down because of a trick we can only do with a robot. And the trick is so good that we had the best um, results for continence after radical prostatectomies in all of the, the Netherlands. So now hospitals come and watch our trick, and after seeing what we are doing, they can repro uh, reproduce the same trick in our, their hospital, and their results are also fantastic. Uh, I don't know if you read about 40 to 80% incontinence after radical prostatectomy. It was in the news a few weeks, a few months ago. 
Well, it's, it's a horrible article because our continent rate is only 2%. After one year, if you say zero or one pet after the surgery is okay. We have a continence, per, continence percentage of uh, 94 people who are not using any pets at all. So we have only uh, a very few continents after this operation. Um, because incontinence is, is quite, um, has a quite impact on the quality of life. It's a very important aspect of taking out a prostate. Talk your patient through and tell them what they have to, uh, have to expect. Then the, the continence is really an issue that everyone talks about. There's a database um, and that says it's 20% incontinence one year post-operative, and that's more than one pet. That, that's what's called incontinence. And there is a recent investigation of the health insurance uh, company that says there's even 30 to 40% of continence. And that's, that's a real percentage because our results were also used in that um, uh, investigation of the insurance company, and they really had the same results. Um, when they looked at their figures, then when we look at our figures. So we can um, really say that our continent, continence percentage is really below 10%. That's what the insurance company also found out. So the 30% incontinence in the whole of Netherlands is, is a true percentage. Um, we stole a technique from Germany where they invented a way to, to diminish the, the continence after the operation, but they do it in an open operation. Very, very difficult. They had um, their hands to articulate and to, 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 to do the operation. And in normal laparoscopy, it is not possible to put stitches like this or to, to cut out uh, a urethra out of the prostate. You have to work backwards. And in laparoscopy, where an instrument has no articulation, it's impossible to do things like this. We see here the, the urethra. This is the urethra. And this is the prostate. And the urethra has... Um, uh, uh, a muscle that um, stops the urine from uh, uh, flowing out. And the sphincter, the sphincter muscle here, goes into the prostate. And if you cut out the urethra here until this place where the, um, uh, the semen is coming into the urethra in the prostate, if you cut this out, then the continence race is much, much better. Normally, we just put here, uh, we, we just cut the, the urethra at the tip of the prostate. And if you cut it here, then you lose this part of the urethra. And our trick is to just peel it out and then stitch it together to the bladder. And this technique that we used during the laparoscopic operation made the difference. Here you see it in a, in a picture. Normally, we would uh, cut the urethra here at the tip of the prostate and we peeled out the urethra. This part is taken out of the prostate. This is the prostate. And now we can cut it here. And this centimeter, one and a half centimeter that we win, makes the difference in the continence. Here you see it cut open. At this place, you see a small bulb where the um, uh, semen is entering the urethra. And if you spare this part of the urethra, then the continent rate is much, much better. Here you see how we stitch it with the robot arms. And, and you can really see how easy working with a robot is when you see the articulation of this of the needle driver, this is a movement you can't make in conventional laparoscopy. Then you have, to have, then, then you have a, an instrument that's straight, can open and close its mouth, and you have to put it from different directions to the urethra, and then you have to hope that the, the angle is like you want it. And every angle is possible with an operation robot. So when you are doing uh, difficult operations, when you have to stitch a lot, then the operation robot is... We can't miss it anymore. It's impossible to, to stop using robots for these kinds of operations. Um, this is the, the opening in the bladder. And this is the opening in the urethra. The prostate is gone. It's in a plastic bag. We take it out after the operation. And here when we stitch it together again. Um, here are some figures uh, that shows um, how much difference it made when we started to do this... Uh, uh, this technique. Um, we have a um, registration after six weeks, three months, and six months. This is before the urethra sparing, and this is with urethra sparing. And this is the difference after six weeks, three months, and six months. Here in at a half, uh, half a year, we have already 88% continent people. So it made quite a, difference, uh, quite a difference for our patients. And the surgical margins, that's something everybody is afraid of when you are peeling the urethra out of the prostate. 
are even better during, during this operation than before, because you are really uh, looking at the, the, the anatomical structures to, to peel the urethra out. So you, you operate maybe a bit um, uh, more precise if you are doing this. At least it's not worse. Um, and this is the continent per percentage after a year. And here you see, after, before the operation uh, with the urethra sparing, we had also quite a, uh, a lot of uh, continent people. But there is a difference. But the big difference is the early continents. So people don't have to wait um, six to nine months before they were continent. They were <coughs> it already after six to, three, uh, six to 12 weeks. And that's quite a difference. That makes a little lot of difference, not only for the patient, but also for the insurance company, because you use less pets, and pets are very expensive. Um, in conclusion, what did robot surgery bring us? Well, in our center, it, it made uh, it possible that I wasn't the only one who was doing laparoscopic prostatectomies. No, when the robot came, we immediately had another colleague that was able to perform the operation in the same way I did before. Um, and last year, we trained another colleague, and he's al she's also doing exactly the same results uh, in just a few months. So it's very trainable. And it can even be more trainable if you have a second console. We have one console during the operation, but when you have two consoles, um, it's like um, when you are learning to drive a car, then there's someone next to you who can touch the brake, who can uh, do something with his own pedals. Well, if there are two consoles, the one who is um, trained can be stopped by the one who's sitting next to uh, this person that's getting trained. So when you've got two, got two consoles, and we are getting two consoles with our next robot, the training is even more safe, and uh, people can learn more because you can let them do more, because that's safe. Um, we performed 60 lap laparoscopic uh, prostatectomies in uh, 2014, and because of the robot and our specialization in the region, there are now about 150 to, 50 to 200 operations. Uh, our um, uh, um, the, the the urology board says you have to do 100 operations every year. That's uh, otherwise you can't do the operation. And I think it's wise because then you do a lot. You don't have to do a lot more, but but you have to um, be experienced in doing <laughs> operations like this. Um, and we introduced our urethra sparing surgery, and that's only possible with the, the operation robots. And we can restart the laparoscopic cystectomies when we got the second uh, system, and it's coming this year. Um, and really important, because we have two surgeons that um, couldn't operate for more than a year because of neck problems and problems with the wrist, the, er 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 um, the ergonomy <laughs> um, is, is much better. It's not perfect but it's much, much better than open surgery and laparoscopic surgery. And people are scar scarce, also uh, urologists and surgeons, so um, this is a very important aspect of robotic surgery. I don't know if there are... Oh, yeah, and of course, with a robot, we have ha happy patients because of the continents, probably, and therefore, happy doctors. <laughs> also very important. <laughs> 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 Um, if this presentation is coming online, then there are also pictures afterwards where you can see the operation in, um, in pictures, um, how we perform the robotic prostatectomy, uh, which instruments we use. Um, if someone is very interested and wants to, um, to look how the operation works and is um, um, a, a, a technische geneeskunde student, he can always uh, come to our hospital and watch an operation. Just contact me by email or by LinkedIn, and then it's possible to um, watch an operation live. Okay? Wow, <laughs> oh, that's a very nice offer. You can also email Studium Generale. We contact you with Herman if you want to be uh, present. So, ha happy patients, happy doctors, snorkeling in the Red Sea, that's a bit <laughs> your experience. So, this Da Vinci robot really has a lot of advantages. Um, are there any questions at the moment for him? I come, come up. Well, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, you mentioned that in open surgery, there is not a lot of innovation or a lack of innovation. Um, but how do you see the innovation or how do you expect changes to this system uh, in the future? What would you like to see improve? This, in this system? Yeah. Well, there are a lot of innovations already going on. Um, single, single port surgery. Um, in laparoscopy, there's also single port surgery, but it's very difficult because of the angulation of the instruments. And in robotics, 
you can put in a robot system that claps like a parachute or a para an umbrella, and then you can operate from different directions. So that's very easy. It's, it's already done at the moment. Um, um, there's something called Firefly. Um, um, it's it's a, a color that you can put into um, lymphatic vessels or in blood vessels, and it makes uh, the tissue uh, green, uh, ICG, and um, it, you can use it to, to, to look if a tissue that you are removing and, and stitching back together, if it's vital or not. If it's not vital, you shouldn't stitch it together. So um, when you have an MRI image, you can put it in a tile pro in your operation. In your operation field, you can like shadow it over your operation field. And all those things, it's, it's it, it, endless. And then there is the, the talk about uh, the, the professor. Well, it's even um, getting more to um, less invasive, less invasive, less invasive. Mm. And the robot made laparoscopy that is less invasive, much more easy. So it's, 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 I think it's the way to go. Okay. Thank you. Mm. And Herman, do you, do you always, I think you are supposed to do, when you have a patient, you tell him or that he has to be operated by a, uh, oops, I'm standing under the microphone, by a robot. Well, and, uh, and are people afraid or are they sometimes refusing for no, oh, gosh, are, no robot? They are very disappointed if I tell some people they don't have to be operated with a robot. <laughs> yes, okay. No, it, it's, um, I think at, at when you are talking about prostate cancer patients, they are very, very well aware of what is possible. They mm -hmm. get a lot of information on the internet, on uh, okay. in our um, 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 multidisciplinary um, um, uh, mm -hmm. approach. Um, all the information make that people are aware of what's possible. Mm -hmm. But the prostate cancer patients are very, very aware because okay. of all the information that's, that's, okay. um, that's good available in the internet. Yes, that's good to hear. Go ahead. Thank you for your talk and all of the pictures. Uh, I was wondering, you, you said there you have six uh, arms, uh, six extra ports. arms, six ports. Well, Four arms of the robot, two of my assistant. Right, so you have two extra arms. I was wondering about when you're working with technology, sometimes your brain gets used to it and it sort of adapts uh, to it. So I'm wondering about the situation you get, you've been operating for a while, you get out of the machine, but you forget that you no longer have the extra arms. <laughs> Or maybe also, do you do you in your, do you also sometimes dream, and then you're, you <laughs> have all of dreamy. these extra yeah. arms? <laughs> Does that do this something to you? It's very nice. You, you are mentioning um, that you are adapting to the machine, but that's true because I I, I told about um, haptical feedback. It's very important when you are doing an operation. When I operate uh, testicles or when I operate something uh, open, my fingers are very important. But when I use the machine. Uh, there is some tactical feedback because I, if I touch bone, I feel bone because the machine doesn't move. But the sight is so precise that the, the haptical feedback you're getting from your eyes. So when I, when I have a very, very fine uh, thread, when I, when I stitch up a blood vessel that I wrecked, uh, sometimes it happens, then I stitch it with very fine uh, thread. It's, it's 6-0 um, ficral, very, very fine, or a PDS, very, very fine. If you just pull it a little bit too hard, it's, it breaks. It never breaks, because I can see with my eyes how much tension I put on it. When I do it with my fingers, I break more thread than when I'm using the robot, because I can see the, the knot falling right to, like it should. It's, you are uh, adapting to the machine. That's absolutely true. Mm -hmm. OK. Nice, nice, nice. Okay, Herman, thank you very much. We turn to Maruska. Um, a robot doesn't do anything autonomously, we learned from you. Um, da Vinci is a slave, and you are the master. And I want a big hand for Master Herman. Thank you very much. <laughs> Herman mentioned that the Da Vinci robot costs 2 million euros. Um, and that's a nice bridge to... Maruska. Maruska is scientific. Maruska Rovers is professor and scientific director of the TechMed Center here at the University of Twente. She is also professor, full professor in Nijmegen at the Radboud uh, UMC, as you can see here. Um, your chair was formerly called Evidence-Based Surgery, but nowadays it's called Medical Technology and Innovation. So I think both titles say a lot what you are doing. Uh, you critically evaluate new technologies in medical 
settings and think about costs and things like that. And you will reflect on the future challenges of surgical robotics. <coughs> A big hand for Marus Karov. Yeah, thanks for the invitation, for me too. Uh, as said, I'm, I'm not a surgeon. I'm clean as a, trained as a clinical epidemiologist, but for the last 10 years in the Rapport UMC, I worked as a scientist in the operating theater. Uh, so I collaborate with all surgeons, so neurosurgeons, urologists, ENT surgeons. Uh, so I do not have a specialty other than methodology and indeed critical evaluation. I would like to take you along with that. Uh, I'm not against robots, some people believe that. I really think it's the future, so I, I vote for robotics and I want to be operated with a robot. Uh, depending on what, but particularly in the future. Uh, but I will talk to you uh, along that as well. Um, this is what Herman told you about. Uh, this is the Da Vinci robot. Uh, and you heard about that and we'll come back to it. This is the most often, the most, the robot most often used in the Netherlands. Herman said that as well. I think all, most surgeons use it and most hospitals have it. I think almost all hospitals nowadays have a robotic system. Uh, not all, but particularly the, the top clinical hospitals. So we had 30 robotic systems in the Netherlands a couple of years ago, and now it's reaching almost towards the 40, and we have 90 hospitals. So it's half of them, but particularly the top clinical ones have this type of robots. But the others on the way are already available. Uh, this is the Cambridge uh, Robotics uh, System of Vesuvius, it's called, from Cambridge Medical Robotics. Um, it's particularly developed for training as well. It's even more easy to learn, they say. That's the claim, at least, than the Da Vinci. And it's more flexible. And then they have a smaller hand cave, because the Da Vinci is developed for males. So the size of the hands is eight, seven or eight. And uh, uh, I'm not, if I'm not correct, uh, Herman, correct me, but this, they have a hand slave of uh, size six, seven. Not a claim they have. Uh, this one is the single port one, Herman also mentioned. Um, so this is just one port and operating the all laparoscopic systems. This is the Hugo from Matronic. And this is more because the Da Vinci system is really a big system and it takes some time to unfold itself. This one is more incrementally, you can be incrementally used and have different arms and you can move the arms separately and move them along the side. It's from Atronic. This one is, uh, I, I knew Sartek would show all his robotic system. This one is from Eindhoven. To you Eindhoven, it's microsure and it's particularly indeed for the small vessels to connect them. So this is not a laparoscopic robotic system. It's called microsure, really to have the fine, very precise microsurgery for vessels. And then, then this is the last one, this is from Moon Medical. It's the Maestro system, which also can be used in an MRI system and other imaging systems. They're all on the market or more or less on the market, so these are already there and you see they're all slightly different from the Da Vinci but incremental different. Uh, what they did do is ask AI, co-pilot, create me a robot of the future. <laughs> Not sure whether it will be this, Sartak showed you your, and I think also it's, it's getting smaller rather than bigger, but it might be autonomous in the future, I'm not sure whether we are already ready for that. If I ask children, group eight, and ask them who wants to be operated by a robotic system, last time there were zero children. Zero. And if you ask them why, they are afraid of mistakes. And even if I say that the surgeon is there, and if I say I, will, I would like to be operated in the future with a robotic system, then they still say, yeah, but they don't see me crying. So I'm not sure whether we will have a completely autonomous system, but I think imaging will be very important in the future, uh, even more than it's now. So it will probably a combination of whatever multi-tasked, multi-faceted imaging system. AI is already integrated in the systems. So that's what I assume will happen. But like JetGTP, we, we couldn't predict it would have been there last year. So I don't say I can predict what happened in the future, but it will change. At the same time, we all know, and I'm not sure whether you know, but otherwise I will convince you, that innovation is quite hard. What we do know from innovations, and this is MedTech <coughs> in, in general, 80% of all ideas will never be launched. So they will never get CE approval or FDA approval. 80% of all things we think of, all innovations, all MedTech innovations, will never get CE approval. 
think about the waste of money. If they do get CE approval, and, and this is particularly matter, and it's similar between, more or less similar between the FDA and Europe, 70% of the devices will disappear in two years. Either because it took too long before they came to the market, or we developed something nobody was waiting for. We still make devices and innovations where we talk with one doctor who's very enthusiastic and not with the critical one, or with the patient who wants something special. It really should go for co-creation, but we don't do that. So these are the numbers, and they didn't change much over time. So innovation is hard, it really is a challenge. In a surgery that has a specific name, this is already from the 1990s, but still actual, it's called Scott's Parabola, and it's uh, the rise and fall of surgical techniques. And what we often see, uh, and in the past I often called it funnily, uh, the toys for the boys, but I think I should say pearls for the girls as well. Um, so what you see here, we are quite enthusiastic in the beginning. It's something new, and that's what you see with the robotic system as well. So also patients ask for it. This new it will be better, so I'd like to be operated with a robotic system. Uh, but we also have examples of the mesh, uh, of the breast implants that started leaking. Uh, and then you get, indeed, the doubt comes in, and it might even do ha damage. And they were laughing about it. And now if we talk about the PIP breast implants, we're laughing about, it. oh, how could we be so stupid? But we have to be critical and evaluate it in a proper way. So this uh, I also called, or I, not, not me, but I used the quote of Mary Dixon Wood. She's from the UK. She called this the ugly baby syndrome. Um, so we're always in favor of the things we innovate or we think of. And we really have to ask ourselves the question, do I give birth to a really good idea? Or maybe, be honest, is my baby ugly? And the only way to know that is to evaluate your innovation from the beginning. And that's a challenge, also in surgery. Because it's always too early to do either a randomized control trial, but I don't think you should always do a randomized control trial. It's invasive like a robotic system. I think I would like to see a, a randomized control trial, where you really compare the robotic system uh, with, an, with laparoscopy or open. What's, what's the current standard? I think for AI or e-health, it can be an other clinical type of study. It doesn't always have to be a randomized, double-blind clinical trial. And double-blind is a challenge anyway in surgery. Uh, but, but there is a challenge with surgeons, because if you are too early, they're still learning, and then you're comparing the learning curve with something that's established. And you don't want that, because you want a proper comparison. But if you are too late, everyone is using the system and say, there's no equipoise, I'm better with the robotic system, and I don't want to go back to the laparoscopic system. So they're not willing to collaborate in a, in a study anymore. And uh, what we also see, because we have to ask informed consent for these types of studies, uh, surgeons seem to have more difficulty by asking informed consent, because they, because they really believe in the system they use. And I think as a patient I would like that. That my surgeon is confident about the instruments and the type of operation he or she is using. So better to ask and indeed a PhD student to ask for informed consent because often there is equipoise, that's a prerequisite for clinical study. Um, but ask, let someone ask, ask for informed consent, not a lessons learned. What about the evidence so far for the robotic system? And this particularly Da Vinci. Last year there was a systematic review of systematic reviews. So this is systematic review. So there have been done 14 systematic reviews on prostate, robot versus laparoscopy, uh, five, uh, five for nephrectomy. Uh, and here you see, uh, see the numbers. So they're all systematic reviews for the robotic system versus either laparoscopy or open, depending on what the current uh, best current practice is and what is done in current practice according to the guidelines. Anybody, any clue about the results? How often is the robotic system better than the alternative? 90%? Herman, what do you think? Yeah. So actually the, the result was that it's more or less equal. The robot is not better, it's also not worse, with one exception, that's prostate cancer, that's slightly better, 
And if you do 200 or more, it can also become cost effective. So for prostate, there is some proof. For all others, it's equal. And there is one operation, this hysterectomy, the FDA put on a hold because there's some serious side effects reported for hysterectomy with the robotic system. So there are also, but that's the only case where there's disadvantage. In most cases, they were equally good, or more or less within ranges. And there are some exceptions that blood loss is lower with the robot system, but quality of life is equally. But overall, the, comment, the, the conclusion was um, that they were equally good. So the challenge is that we should develop robotic systems, but also other innovations that do have added value for society and patients, are effective, in my opinion. It should be affordable, yeah, because healthcare costs are increasing. So we have to look at costs. Staffing issues is a real issue at the moment. So if you want something new, me new medical device, but also a robotic system, healthcare insurance also asks, does it help us with the staffing shortage we have? Uh, and then we have to decarbonize footprint, sustainability, climate issues. Because you saw it on the pictures, all medical devices use a lot of disposables. It's not only the robotic systems, almost all medical devices use a lot of disposables. So the waste in healthcare is also due to these sort of instruments and medical devices we use. So these are the issues we have to take into account. Uh, and so you have to think about the problem. Problem and conditions, and I also have a short movie for you, uh, how to do that. Whom's room, uh, problem is it, and how to do that? See where it starts. It did work before. Nah. Otherwise, I have to do the same as we did, so test it. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, here. It's, it's over, yeah, you have to move the mouse to the... Yeah. And now we don't have sound. Frans, can we have sound or is your, uh, let, let me see. This one is okay. Yes, I pulled the audio off just a second. That's my ah. fault. Now we have sound. You, you turn it back in time and then we have sound. Let me see. Yeah, now it's working. It's working? I think so, I hope so. An innovation should solve a problem or solve a problem better to have added value. As an innovator, you probably have an idea about what that problem is. However, it is not your problem. It is a problem of patients, caregivers, or other stakeholders. What counts is whether they perceive your innovation as a solution to the problem as they define it. Therefore, it is crucial to define a problem from their perspectives. This is not trivial. So many innovations have failed for solving the wrong problem. Suppose you believe that an AI-powered surgical robot could be more accurate than a surgeon by removing more tumor tissue without damaging healthy tissue or could help ameliorate a problem of staff shortages in the future. What makes you believe that accuracy is a problem for patients or surgeons? Does anyone feel a need to replace the surgeon? Could it be that the problem of staff shortages revolves automatically as a result of prevention and demographic trends? Is it true that the robot could replace the surgeon, or would it only change the surgeon's job, and how would he or she feel about that? So, in summary, you need to make sure that your innovation tackles the right problem and us the best way to tackle the problem. Go back to the, this one. Yeah. 
So this is uh, feeds back to what I said before, involve all stakeholders so that you indeed tackle the right problem and co-create together the right innovation. And so we made an online education model, which you can see here, and these slides will also be provided to you. Uh, and you can see more of those sort of movies, but also sort of education material, how to involve your stakeholders and how to do the modeling, which I tell you in a minute more about. Uh, and how to know indeed what is effective and to create innovation we're all waiting for. And this is the innovation funnel, you might know, it might be rough, so we can start from the unmet need to preclinical, first in human, evaluation, clinical trials, phase three, implementation, and then the scale up. And what we often do, we spend our money, and also NWHO uh, and uh, Zon and Wei, they spend money on clinical trials immediately. So we start here with evaluation. And I would play to start over here and co-create it from the beginning and start the evaluation. So you can steer together with the surgeon, with the patient, to develop the right innovation or medical device or robotic system or whatever you want to develop. And we did work on this, so we wrote a paper which was published in, in Nature Medicine a month ago with the ideal collaboration, which is specifically on surgical evaluation from an early phase to a later phase. And there we describe all phases from the beginning to the later stages. And for the rest of this talk, I would particularly take you to the early stage and how to work there and collaborate on there and what type of research to do there. So you, and this is what I suggest to start early with. And you can say, oh, you can't do a systematic review when you create something new. You can't. Because what we can do is see how good are we doing it now. So for prostectomy, prostectomy, you could already look at the open or the laparoscopic procedure and see, hey, is there some room for improvement? And where is the room for improvement? And if so, can I develop something in co co collaboration with the surgeon where, how to increase that room for improvements in the whole line the surgeon is operating on. So that's where systemic review comes in, to show what's currently been done and where there is, well, as I said, room for improvement. Then you can involve stakeholders. I already mentioned the surgeon, but if you develop something, you can also ask the patient what is important for you, uh, the nurses alongside maybe uh, other people in society, and ask them what actually is the problem, what is important for you, uh, we also studied 15 companies that developed a medical device, surgical device, and asked them how often they involved the patients in developing the medical device. How many do you think? Zero. Zero. None of them asked the patients what was important to them. Yeah, but the surgeon works with this device. If it's entering a patient, yeah, but they're under the anesthesia. They won't, me they won't measure it. It's not a problem. So I think it's important to involve them in the early phase. Then you can do the early HTA, and early HTA is indeed you model what the current pathway is, where the costs are and the effects, and then you can see where is the room for improvement, and where can I also still win some costs for the cost effectiveness, and I will show you in a minute. And that steers the clinical studies, because you know what is important, what outcomes are important for both the stakeholders and for the effectiveness. So you steer the clinical studies, and you don't have to study everything, but you can particular point on those things that are important uh, for, uh, in the other uh, smaller studies you can do up front. We did this for the robotic system, any robotic system, but we used the Da Vinci case as an example. So it's been published uh, three years ago. Uh, and what we did is actually, and Herman, it's quite nice, had a presentation before me because you have seen the system now. Um, so you have some fixed costs. And I will tell you in a minute what we did, but we played along with it. Uh, you have some variable costs for the disposables and the things you have to throw away. Uh, and then you have the revenues. So you have the operation time. Sometimes you need to convert. Uh, you have, might have complications, hospital duration, quality of life, and indeed the ergonomics of the surgeon because they get neck hernias and, and other hernias due to the operation, uh, the, uh, the way they have to stand. And, that, and I've heard that for obese patients, it's even more difficult than for the more thinner patients. Uh, in the paper, we use one million for the system. Here we use two million for the system, but it's an online tool, you can play along with it, and we'll show that in the end. 
and it's also in the paper. So there are also maintenance costs, so Da Vinci has to come back every year, but any other surgical company as well for maintenance. A depreciation year for medical devices is seven years in Europe. Uh, an interest rate of 4.2%, that's what we use in the cost manual according to the Dutch Healthcare Institute. And then we played around with the number of procedures. Uh, we used the numbers of Radboud UMC and CWZ. They also collaborate together and operate together uh, about 100, but we vary between 70 and 200 because that's indeed advised for most surgical procedures. Here you see the cost, the variable cost, so that's not the fixed cost price yet, for the robotic system, uh, a laparoscopic procedure and an open procedure, you see the cost difference as compared to the robotic system. So actually, for the variable cost, compared to scopic, you have to earn back those 204 with any sort of effectiveness to make it really better, because it costs more than you want to see something in the effectiveness. And this is the amount, so 1300 for the variable cost, but I'm not talking about the fixed cost yet. And you can discuss, should we also earn back the fixed cost because we pay the system, um, but of course it's a depreciation of seven years, so it might make healthcare more expensive because we, hospital has to pay for the system anyway. So although there is one reimbursement fee, well, it will be paid, the system will be paid somewhere. So here you see it again as compared to scopic and uh, laparoscopic. So fixed cost, if we uh, calculate with 100 procedures, uh, the cost per procedure is 4,600 euros. Extra cost per procedure for the variable cost is 204. So this amount you have to earn back in any of the outcomes as a revenue. And that's what we played along with. And if you compare it with open, it's even slightly more. You have to earn back 6,000 euros. And of course, if the system is a million, it's lower, but it's an online tool, so you can play along with it. Something about the number of procedures, because that's always an argument. Yeah, if you do more than 200, it will become cost effective. That's partly true, because you indeed see you have to do more than 150, but you always have those variable costs. So you always have to earn back something. It's always more expensive than any, uh, any of the other two procedures. Well, look at the revenues then. What did we calculate with? What cost? Eh? Because we want cost for costs. Um, what we used for the operation time, and this is in the cost manual, but we also used uh, numbers cost from the Radboud UMC, but were quite in line. So it was about 13 euros per minute. Conversion rate for materials and an open procedure, we calculated 337 euros. Uh, days in hospitals, this is according to the cost manual. It might have increased over time a bit, but this was uh, three years ago. Uh, we used 642 according to the manual we use. The qualities, we said, well, will be mostly oncological procedures, and then in the Netherlands we use 80,000 euro per quali. Sometimes we use 50,000 euro, so in the UK they use uh, 50, 40, 50,000 pounds. Um, but we calculate with 80,000 euros per quali, and then uh, we calculate working day for a surgeon. Uh, this is the cost the manual versus uh, Rabat UMC prices. And we did this on an individual basis. So in the tool, you can play around with several revenues at the same time. We did it one by one and see what you have to earn back regarding the effectiveness for the cost, the extra cost you make for the robotic system. So here you have the extra cost as compared to laparoscopic. Um, <clears throat> what you have to earn back in qualies is 0.06. That doesn't seem that much, but it's equal to 22 days in perfect health. We haven't seen that in any study yet for the robotic system. For hospitalization, you have to win, and you do win some days with the robotic procedure, but not seven and a half days. But as I said, this is one by one, and if you make combination, it might differ. If you look at operation time, you need to win about 360 minutes. They do win a bit if you are an experienced surgeon, but not this, this amount of time. Absenteeism of the surgeon, the days, 
uh, 6.3 days completely absent, so you can't do anything else during that day. Conversion should be more than 100%, so that's not applicable. Probability of preoperative, uh, perioperative, sorry, complications should also be larger than 100%, uh, so not applicable. And the probability of persistent complications, uh, you should have a redu reducement of uh, more than 71%. At Juvent therapies, a reduction of 95%. Metastasis, reduction of 11%. So we more or less show that you should gain some gain in qualities to become cost effective. Uh, we did the same for an uh, open procedure, but you can imagine that the numbers will increase a bit because the costs were slightly higher. So we also did it for 200 procedures per year. So the base case was with 100 procedures. Well, you see that it becomes slightly lower, but you still need quite some effectiveness gain for all of these outcomes. Um, it is possible, particularly if the cost of the robotic systems, and that will happen when you have more, uh, more other systems in the market, which I showed where I started off with, and there will be more. So the cost of the robotic system will go down, of all the systems, and then, of course, the numbers will be different. So we made an online tool. Every hospital can play around with it themselves and see where they earn the extra investments back, yes or no. And you can here, you can play with different outcomes at the same time to see to whether you earn it back. And it's a shiny app, you can use it whenever you want um, to see whether it's cost effective. So at the moment, I don't think it's cost effective, but with the reducing the cost due to the other system that come to the market and due to the evaluation, I'm quite convinced that the future is a robotic system, but we have to work on it. So all students in the room, please go on with the good work and try to make uh, it cheaper and even better. Uh, and and I, what I hope that you take home um, is that we need new systems with all challenges that are coming towards us in the healthcare, but it's never too early to evaluate a new system or a new robotic system. Start as early as possible because we don't want systems like this. We don't want a robotic system where this little boy just wants his mommy to, play, uh, to stick the plaster. Uh, but, but start as early as possible to the evaluation. Then you can steer the development of whatever device you're developing. So thanks for the attention. Maruska, thank you very much for your down-to-earth talk. Uh, I was just wondering, when you were uh, looking at the cost calculation, did you take into consideration that because working with a robot is less strenuous for the surgeon, that they might have less sick days, and thus um, every surgeon costing a thousand euros per day, if they are more available, uh, that mm -hmm. might make a difference as well? Yeah, so this uh, absence of okay. the surgeon in days... Yeah. No, no, this is really the ergonomics, and it's so the, the surgeon has to be away for six complete days or 4.7 complete days and can't do anything else then. And, and what the, sorry. sorry, no, yeah, go ahead. No, my question is that um, if you look at all surgeons working with robots, that you have less surgeons being sick. That's basically because they have to, uh, they are in a more comfortable position, so they might have less, I don't know, sick days themselves that they are not feeling well and if you look at that, that yeah we didn't do it that way okay. we did it indeed uh, related to the ergonomics okay. we also didn't take into account the climate issue yet we didn't take into account the staffing issue here because although it's used different in different hospitals but you might need less staff uh, if you do it well so uh, at that time we didn't take it into account so we may maybe should update it because that's also an important uh, issue at the moment Mm -hmm. Maruska, you talked about the ugly baby syndrome. Is my baby ugly? C could you say something about Sartak's babies? Because he had a lot of very intriguing inventions. Is he, taking, uh, is he talking enough to stakeholders? Is he solving the right problems? Could you say something yeah. about his work? Sartak already left the room, so you can... <laughs> 
speak uh, out, out uh, freely? Uh, because uh, I work both at Radboud UMC yes. and, and, and both here. Uh, yeah. I'm a scientific director of TechMed and I still see a lot of tech push uh, here, but yeah. I also see a lot of surgeons that they think they can solve the issue and don't use the systems, right? Oh, yes. Okay. So I, I, uh -huh. what I really would like is indeed to collaborate together because mm -hmm. then you solve the unmet need of the surgeon mm -hmm. and you need technicians to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there are still different worlds and they can be and should be connected better, better. in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, but, but I also think we should play around a bit. So I'm not ga against playing around and developing, but then put it in a model uh, forward and backwards. As because it's iterative. Eh? Yeah. Also what I showed the stakeholder and the modeling, you can do this iterative. Yeah. If you have new evidence, you can feed it in the model. Exactly, and involve patients yeah. when they are And I know that they talk with stakeholders, but often it's a positive surgeon yeah. they take on board as a stakeholder. And yes. you should also look at your critical friends. We would not have had the iPhone if we would have listened to the unmet needs. That's why I say we should really <laughs> play around as well. Mm. Uh, but otherwise, our healthcare costs are still increasing and people cannot pay it anymore. So it's also, if you get, want to get it reimbursed, they look, healthcare insurance, healthcare institute, even in the US, they, they look at cost effectiveness as well. So you better yeah. start from the beginning and take it into account and then prove that you're even better than whatever you can think of during the evaluation. <laughs> then start the other way around and then in the end end with something that's not that more than incremental than you thought from the beginning. Because as yeah. I showed, 80% fails. And everybody thinks it's, it, they, they, they invent something really big and really new. Mm -hmm. And if mm -hmm. you are in the 20% that does succeed, then I think within the 20, it's a very small amount that is that new and moonshot-like project. Okay, thank you, thank you. With these wise words, we have to round off. We, I think it was a fascinating evening. I've got a big hand for Herman and Sartak, who is not here. Thank you. And Marushka.